Hello again. We're doing solving linear equations, uh, but in this particular instance, we're doing a subset of it. Uh, ratios and proportions. And before I go over these two problems that I wrote down here, which is I believe is really all you really need in order to solve a proportion properly, because we've already done that to an extent, is just define what a ratio is. And you can see a ratio in three different forms. It's A colon B, A to B, or A over B. And essentially what a ratio is, is it's just a fraction. That's all it is. But it can be written in any one of these three forms. And why I write proportions is because these two particular examples that we're going to do are proportions. A ratio is a fraction. A proportion is just a fraction equaling another fraction. Fraction equals another fraction. That's all a proportion is. And there are different ways to solve proportions. You can you know, multiply by 6 on both sides and multiply by 30. Or you can use the cross product property, which is more commonly referred to as cross multiplying. And let me say that again because you will encounter this later on in math, and it's a little bit more difficult to differentiate. When you have an equal sign, and I'm going to say this again when that time comes too, because students will have difficulty and sometimes need a gentle reminder. When you have an equal sign in between two fractions, and each fraction is on one side, let me say that again, you have a fraction on each side of an equal side. The simplest way to usually do it is through just cross multiplying. Uh, when it's multiplication or division in between, totally different problem. You don't handle it the same way. But when there's an equal sign in between, it's a proportion, and generally you just want to cross multiply. It's pretty quick. It's what you've already done when you were in elementary school, so you know, do what you know how to do. Simple as that. Why change it? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So in this case, we're going to cross multiply. 6 times x is 6x, 11 times 30 is 330. How did I know that? I don't know. 10 times 30 is 300, plus an extra 30 is 330. Big deal. Okay. I have 6 times x equals 330. I want to divide by 6 on both sides, and the reason why I divide by 6 on both sides is because it's a multiplication in between, and the only way to get rid of a multiplication is by dividing. But what I do on one side, I do on the other. 6 divided by 6 is 1. 1x, one or just x, equals. Now, again, I've already figured this out, but I'll go ahead and show you a cute little trick to do this. How do I know that 330 divided by 6 is 55? I don't really know. I know 30 divided by 6 is 5, and that leaves 300 left, and 300 divided by 6 is 50. 50 plus 5 is 55. If you don't believe me, go ahead and try it. Um, I'll show you why not. I did this in my head really quickly. You would agree that 330 is the same thing as 300 plus 30. 300 divided by 6 is 50 plus 5, 55. You don't have to write that down. I'm just showing you how I did it in my head very quickly. Okay, next one. 4 over x equals 8 over x minus 3. I like this one because it's the start of a new type of proportion problem, and it usually requires you to do a little bit more work. Initially, at least. When you practice it enough, or it's a problem similar to it, you don't have to do as much work or show as much, but initially when you do this problem, you'll probably mess up. So you want to show your work. And it's still cross-multiplying. So I have two ratios. There's an equal sign in between, so it's a proportion. And here's the only difference that I'm going to make in this one. I'm going to actually write out what I have to multiply. 4 times x minus 3. I'm actually writing that out. I've never done that before on any of these other problems. But this one's more difficult. It's got two terms in this denominator, so it makes things difficult or more different. Equals 8 times x, which is just 8x. Uh, we could go a little bit further on this and talk about domain. We'll see, actually. 4 times x, 4x, four, 4 times negative 3, negative 12. Don't forget your equals, 8x. Subtract by 4x on both sides. You could subtract by 8x and 8 12, but it's actually easier to do this because you can't combine the terms. Line them up. 
4x minus 4x is 0, it's not 1, it's not 1x, it's not x. We've got negative 12 equals 8x men minus 4x men, it's not 4, it's 4x men. 4 times x, how do I get rid of that multiplication operation in between? I divide. x or 1x equals negative divided by a positive is negative. 12 divided by 4 is 3. x equals negative 3. There's actually one more thing I really do want to talk about here. And it's with this particular problem here. So I want to erase this. This is more of an advanced concept. Uh, some students might already know what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about domain and others won't necessarily. This is probably the first example I think I've done where I've encountered a answer that I have to double check. x equals negative 3, that's a given. I want to talk about what x cannot equal very quickly. And this is something that I'm going to talk about later and later, too. This is just a very quick introduction to it. So don't get too scared if you don't understand it completely, because I have students in pre-calculus that don't necessarily understand this until you remind them over and over. So with that said, what can you never divide a number by? And the answer is you can never divide by zero. You can never have zero in the denominator. Uh, really quick math lesson as to why. Uh, that's practical and worldwide. If you have, I don't know, uh, three loaves of bread and you divide by two people, and you're always dividing by people, how much does each person get? It's 1.5. So if you have three loaves of bread and you divide by two people, you have 1.5. If you have zero loaves of bread and you divide by two people, how much does each person get? The answer is zero. If you have no food and there's two people, how much, how much food does each person get? Nothing. We're starving, literally. Nothing. You're not going to get anything. However, if I switch that problem around and I say, I have two loaves of bread and I have zero people, how much does each person get? It's a stupid question. Well, it's a foolish question, actually. If you've got, you know, two loaves of bread, and there's nobody around to eat it, there's no point for the loaves of bread. Because there's no people around. It's arbitrary, it's capricious, it's trivial in nature. This is something called undefined. You can't define it. Actually, when and if you ever try to choose to pursue a calculus course, you can actually learn something slightly different than this. The answer isn't necessarily undefined. What it is, is it's one limit will approach infinity and the other will approach negative infinity from a given side. But that's a much, much, much more advanced concept that's not going to be explained right now. Although, it really isn't that difficult once you do it. Anyways, back to what I was going to say. So you can never divide by zero. It's an arbitrary question, an arbitrary point. It's like saying, you know, what I said before, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? That, that's a loaded question. It's a foolish question. Why do I care if it makes a sound if it's, first of all, not, not really my prerogative if trees make sounds, and number two, if I can't use it because nobody's around? It's, it's, it's foolish. So, what I'm trying to say here is this. You've got this problem. You can't divide by zero. You can't ever have zero in the denominator. Well, my question is, what's going to make this denominator zero? If I plug in or if I substitute in a value for x, What's going to make that zero? And the answer is zero. If this is one, what's the denominator? If x is one, the denominator is one. If x is two, the denominator is two. If x is three, the denominator is three. If x is zero, the denominator is zero. I can't have that. It's, it's an arbitrary case. So I have to write down, and you don't have to actually, but it's a fun little fact that you might have to learn later, especially if you pursue more mathematics, is that x cannot equals zero. Well, x equals negative three. Why, why do I care if it cannot equal zero? It just cannot. You cannot have a zero in the denominator. Now, that's one of the answers that it cannot equal no matter what. There is another answer. 
If I plug in a 0 here, my denominator is negative 3. 0 minus 3 is negative 3. If I plug in a 1, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. What value for x, if I substitute it in, will make this denominator 0? What subtracted by 3 will make it 0? The answer is 3. x cannot equal 3. Because if x is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0. That makes the denominator on this fraction 0 won't work. So besides just x equaling negative 3 here, which is the correct answer, it cannot equal 0 or it cannot equal 3. And the reason why I talk about that is because when we explore quadratics, this answer and this answer might be the same because you'll have more than one answer. And then all of a sudden you can't use it. You'll say, well, this works, but you can't use it. In this case, it's perfectly innocent. It's fine. But this is good exposure. More exposure will be given when we get to that appropriate section. But it's nice to have a little introduction. Okay. Hopefully I didn't you know, confuse you too much there. It is a difficult concept for many students to get, so don't feel lost or muddled if you, or uh, discouraged if you feel a little muddled. It, I assure you that not everybody gets it the first time they see it. In fact, the majority of students don't get it the first time they see it. But with constant exposure, you start to get it a little bit more. With that said, have a great day.